Hello one, hello all, and welcome to the World Affairs Council of New Hampshire's Global in the Granite State podcast. We love having you tune in and appreciate your efforts to remain a globally engaged citizen who prioritizes important conversations about top global issues. In case you are wondering, I am Tim Horgan, and I am the Executive Director of the World Affairs Council of New Hampshire and your host of this program. Also, if you are wondering, the World Affairs Council of New Hampshire is your go-to source for global conversations where you don't have to worry about any agenda. Our only goal is to provide accurate information on what is going on in the world. Today, we are talking about the second coup in Africa in as many months and the 14th attempted coup in Africa since 2021. However, before we get to that, I want to be sure to thank everyone who makes the work of the World Affairs Council of New Hampshire possible. As a community-supported organization, we rely on the support of members, donors, sponsors, and grants. Thank you to each and every one of you who has donated to the cause. A special thank you to our podcast sponsor and great friend of the council, McLean Middleton. McLean Middleton is one of New England's premier full-service law firms with over 100 attorneys throughout offices in New Hampshire and Massachusetts. McLean Middleton's attorneys have been providing trusted legal services to businesses throughout the region for over 100 years. Learn more at McLean.com. Without this amazing global community of supporters, none of this would be possible. With that said, let's get to the meat of the conversation. did not think we would be back here talking about coups in Africa after covering the one in Niger for last month's episode, but here we are. With the military takeover in Gabon on August 30th, we are left to wonder who is next in the series of undemocratic transfers of power, seemingly to be led by the presidential guards. If I was leader of an African country today, I would be watching my own presidential guard really closely these days. Of course, as we learned in last month's episode, taking down the leader of the presidential guard is not necessarily the way to go here, but man, you've got to hope that you've got a great relationship with whoever is overseeing your protection. When those charged with protecting you are the ones overthrowing you, well, you just don't have much of a chance. Anyway, as reports came out about the latest coup, there was a lot of shock and surprise particularly since this happened hours after President Ali Bongo was elected to a third term as president. We will get into that a little later, but I was so happy to connect with Jean Hakuziman, founder and director of NH Songa and a deputy editor at Amhambo Africa. You can read more about his background in the episode description. I'm from Rwanda, that's where I was born, and I had a chance to work in a few countries in Africa. That gave me the broad picture of Africa in many angles. So I was a journalist, and I'm still doing that. So, hours after President Ali Bongo was declared the winner of the latest election, the leader of the presidential guard initiated a coup attempt and placed President Bongo in custody. Now, a couple of things to note about elections in Gabon. Ali Bongo succeeded his father, Omar, as president. Omar had served as president for over 40 years, and this was Ali's attempt to secure a third term. Term limits for president were abolished in 2003, so that was not a legal concern, although many would find that concerning. But there were changes made to how the president was elected earlier this year. Instead of having a two-round system, it was reduced to one, and the term was reduced from seven to five years. What this means is that whoever got the most votes in the single round would win the presidency, not needing an actual majority, as was previously required. This can make it easier for the incumbent to win re-election as the multiple parties split the opposition vote. In addition... You will find that in most of the, these countries, it's a deal done, you know? So you go to election, but you know how it will look like. Imagine someone who has been managing the whole power for those years, it's hard to lose. You have the military, you have the money, you have the government coffin, 
you have everything that is on, in your power to win the elections. So that's how it has been. There is that populism. When the election period comes, people will make sure that everyone is singing the same song, you know, chanting the next president, who is the current president. And then during the election day, it's like you're going to finish the job. There's no that stiff competition among contenders or you will always sometimes find that the ongoing president or the incumbent has organized the way that he will have a second line of candidates who are weak and who he can manage. And then you end up by not having any fair competition in the game. Ali Bongo comes from a political dynasty in Gabon who took over power from his father 14 years ago. All told, the father and son held power for... 50 something actually because Omari Bongo who is the father of Ari Bongo Ari Bongo is ousted now but Omari Bongo took the power in 67 that's uh, back in days I was not born <laughs> but I remember that name when I was growing up as the name that was around the news, Omar Bongo, the president of Gabon. So he has been there from 67 up to 2009 when he died. He was still the president. And then he passed that baton to his son, Ari Bongo, who managed the transitional period and then found a way into getting elected as the president until serving two terms, until uh, two weeks ago when he wanted to serve another third term. That's more than 10 years on power. And yeah, that's how the family has been keeping the power in the same room, in the same family house from 67 up to almost now. It is then interesting to wonder how the people of Gabon may feel about this takeover. If you believe the results of this election, President Mungo gained 64% of the total vote, with voter turnout pegged at 56% of registered voters seems pretty solid. However, earlier this year, one of his main rivals was detained at the border and accused of money laundering. Based on reporting by the BBC, many people seemed tired of the Bongo family's dynasty and celebrated this military takeover. My analysis would be that people were happy to see him going. What I'm not sure is how they feel about a new one because, again, the same family lineup is still emerging because The current strongman in Gabon is the cousin to the president. So it's not a direct cut between the family or extended family with the power. But people are not happy because I was there in 2016 when there was another election where Ali Bongo also won and there was a lot of riots in the streets. That one... Many analysts, they believe he lost it. And but the guy who was the second candidate won it, but he was not given the opportunity to rule Gabon. That was a popular guy named Jean Ping, who has been the secretary of the African Union. He was known all over the town. And the people were so angry so that they took streets to demonstrate that this was not a fair game where you have defrauded us, you have taken our victory, and you have given to a Bongo who gave it to himself. How did President Mongo then win this election with a huge majority of voters if the people of Gabon seemed happy to see him go? What are some of the factors that allowed a seemingly unpopular president to retain power through an election? This time around, the candidates were so weak, very weak, the, the contenders, uh, who is, let's say, uh, on Ondo, who was the second candidate, he was not that strong, but also there is another number of other candidates that is not giving a chance to the opposition. In many ways for these countries, when the second candidate can win, it's when he has a unit with the other candidates, then they, they manage to erect a front that can go against the current president. But for this time, the other candidates were divided. And there was no chance for this guy. But for 2016, which was the previous election, they were united around the jumping candidates. And I remember their headquarters was near my house. I can see all political opponents coming together to make a big you know, front against the Aribongo. And that's why 
that they managed to bring people to the erection centers. People were mobilized and they were, we're going to win this. You're going to oust this family that has been taking out of our economy for these decades. And they did, but they didn't have a chance because Ali Bongo managed the way to sneak in and grab the power again. But this time, the opposition was weak, which I believe Ali Bongo had a chance to win it again. Looking past the election and to why this coup happened now, it becomes clear that the military leaders here realized they needed additional rationale from other coup leaders in the region as to why Bongo needed to be removed from power. I will note here again, the term limits for a president in Gabon were eliminated in 2003, and Ali Bongo's father served for 42 years. I point this out as it directly contradicts some of the reasoning the junta has given. For example, General Origi Ngema was saying that President Ali Bongo has violated the constitution. He is not allowed to have a third term, which could be true because most of presidents in Africa, they are easily changing the constitution to grab a third term when they were allowed to serve two terms. And then they find a way to easily change the constitution when they are still on the power. They add more terms or they extend whatever. So that's what those generals sometimes they present as a reason. We think you have violated the constitution. Now we want to bring back the order. That's what is happening with the general in Gabon. He has also another line of explaining why he took power. He said the president is not able to serve. He had a stroke. It is interesting, although not unusual, that they have invoked the constitution here. As I'm pretty sure it doesn't say anything about a military coup being the proper way to resolve constitutional issues. It seems like perhaps that could be the purview of the constitutional court in Gabon. Now, the constitutional court is composed of three members appointed by the president, two by the National Assembly, one by the Senate, and three by the Superior Council of the Judiciary, which itself is headed by the president and the justice minister, meaning that allies of the president fill six of the nine seats, so it might not be the most reliable court. However, the military has at least paid lip service to democracy and a return to civilian rule, indicating that they need two years to set up fresh elections. I believe those are empty words. They have not proven to be true, because if you go in the 70s, when you go back to analyze some speeches of the now ruling all the presidents, you will find that that's what they've been saying. If you take, for example, Museveni's speech when he was descending to power in Uganda, he was, we're going to make sure that democracy is right. We're going to make, make sure that we serve a few terms and we are all done. So those are the beginning words. But since you are in the Paris, when you have seen the red carpet for some years, it's like it sticks in your mind that you don't want to go. The more you compile, you bring the power into your fist, the more you want to hold it until. I think those are empty words. I don't recall quite the way it has been very successful from a military coup d'etat to a civilian order, which I really feel. I'm trying to have a reservation. I'm looking forward to see how the Chadian young man will make it, the president in charge, how he will return to civilian institutions. I'm quite, I'm waiting. So I don't feel it's something that is going to happen. They will find a way to get out of the military, but without getting out, calling themselves civilians, then represent again to the election. And they know that they're going to be elected. Again, even though many people may be happy to see the Bongo family go, it seems that they might not be much happier with the new regime, as many commentators have identified that this coup was not undertaken to improve lives, but rather to maintain the power of the elites. That seems to be the case in almost all coups, not surprisingly, but the similarities between this coup and the one in Niger continue beyond this. Both were undertaken by the leader of the presidential guard. Both countries receive high levels of international aid each year, which is now jeopardized by the coup, and both were undertaken without violence. However, one big difference is that Niger seemed on the right path in moving forward with its democracy, while Gabon continued its long history of dynastic rule and kleptocracy. In addition, Gabon has not seen the same problems with insurgency that the countries in the Sahel have. However, as we talked about in last month's episode, the leaders of the military are not changing in these countries, 
So is there really going to be improved security? In the cases of Mali and Burkina Faso, the security situation has actually further deteriorated. So when I analyze the Nigel and other coups that are happening in the region, first of all, there is a geopolitical different context. Because in Niger, you are in the north and Gabon is in the central. And when you go by security and peace-wise, Gabon has been peaceful for this long time. The surrounding countries are peaceful in a way. You have Cameroon, you have other countries around, they are peaceful in a way. But in Niger, that's one of the areas where we have these extremist groups. They are spiraling around. They are developing, they are growing, and they are killing around. The security is an issue for the population, and that can prompt the military to come out and, hey, we're going to make sure that you have the safety or the security you need, and we are the one who can do that against the civilian government, so they can find a way in. But also those coups, they have one resemblance or one similarity. There is French resentment, kind of angry against France that has been colonizing most of those countries for the last decolonization period, but also the France has not left the area even after the independence time. They have been finding a way to control the economy, to trade, to control the government in a way. So that has been making people angry, especially the new generation. It's easier to build something upon that resentment and you find support, like in Niger, where you find people demonstrating in the street saying, hey, France, get out, get out. Again, the same to Burkina Faso, the same to Mali. That's what is happening in those countries. So the tiny difference with Gabon is that it has been peaceful in the area but France, again, is something that comes in the mouth of the new generation. They want to change. Another interesting wrinkle in all of this is the health of Ali Bongo, which has been in question for some time. Unlike in Niger, where President Bouzoum remains under house arrest, President Bongo has been released by the military, citing his need for medical attention abroad. Back in 2018, he suffered a stroke that kept him from executing his duties for almost a year. That has made him looking like he doesn't have those physical appearance, ability to serve. I don't know mentally how he is, but physically you can see it. You can see the move. You can see the voice. He has taken some time out of the TV. He has taken some time in the hospital. He has following medical checkups as well. So that's one reason Origi Gema is advancing for President Bongo as someone who is unable to serve, and that justifies how he wants to take the country in his arms. Based on the questions that many Americans have about the mental fitness of national-level political leaders and many candidates on both sides of the aisle, I guess we cannot point too many fingers in this space, but President Bongo's apparent diminished state does bring the election result further into question. He barely won the election in 2016 when he was a younger and more vibrant man, but this past election he won by a significant margin. As we already discussed, there were several factors that helped in this win, but it is an interesting part of the story nonetheless. So, as we find ourselves back here again talking about a coup in Africa, it continues to make me wonder why these have been seemingly so frequent in recent times. My belief is that the more you serve, the more you make enemies. And those enemies, they are political enemies, they are military enemies. And then if you have military enemies and you keep them around, they also know your weakness. Those generals who are ascending to the power, they have been around in the Paris. They knew the weaknesses of their bosses. When you say this guy in Gabon, he has been the Paris from Omari Bongo to Ari Bongo. So he knows the weakness of the bosses or the deposed presidents. So he has been following up. He has been accused of being part of a plot to overthrow the government in between the years. So, and he was sent to be the military attaché in the embassies outside of the country. That's one way of 
expressing someone that you are feeling like he may be a danger to your power. So that anger can be kept somewhere. You can't think it is quickly normalized that you can call him back and you make him the top presidential guard so that you might be bringing a fire around the corner. So those are feelings, all those ways of doing things, they are similar to other presidents and that can be a way to find the next coup. They have enemies in the political arena, in the military arena, and that can be a danger for them. As we look ahead to figure out who might be next, it may be that the next one is not far off. However, if we could predict who is next, if anyone, from across the ocean, I am sure the people in power in those countries would have even clearer insights and would already be working to insulate themselves from the threat. For example, when you see Cameroon, we have Paul Bia, who has been also serving those many as 40-something as a president of the country. I can't predict the enemies he has met during his presidency. And when you see him, you feel that he has the physical ability diminishing every day. He's getting old. I've seen some video where he's reminded who is in the room when he's attending a meeting. So that those feelings, they can make people very angry to find a way to manifest, to grab the power they've been deprived for a long time. There might be next coup in the region. We have old serving presidents and they've got enemies in the area and you never know when they will turn around and say, hey, we saw this happening somewhere. We want this to happen in this country. Another factor that I can't ignore is the youth. The youth has a voice in these things. The new generation, they fear us sometimes. They can do even what the adult cannot do. If you compare the analogy with the Arab Spring, the way it happened, you can draw a lesson that youth might be a factor to do something going forward. They might be the next coup in the region. All that to say that these things are really hard to predict, and you never know when one is going to happen. A coup is not the inevitable end of the challenges facing these countries, and Africa is not the only region to have experienced coups or coup attempts. So we need to be careful as outside observers on drawing too many conclusions from the experience of these countries over the past three years. I think the idea of West and Savior, it's no longer work in many ways. People can do things by themselves in Africa. Africa can find good rulers. Africa can find good presidents. They can do better. They can do things in a way that can develop the continent. But again... That Western hand is still weighing in the African affairs. It might be not seen openly, but I believe it's invisible, but it's working hard. When you have one strong national leadership, it can prove things to work. But if you have a weak national leadership, it will always find a way to call the Western intervention, Western saviorism as the necessary ingredient to make things work in the country. Seemingly, however, many countries in Africa fall into what is called the resource trap, that those countries that have a lot of mineral, oil, or other resource wealth tend to not develop as quickly, and the spoils are not shared broadly. This is true for Gabon, where about one-third of the population lives under the poverty line, meaning under five and a half dollars a day. The unemployment rate has reached 22%. The UN has estimated that around $600 to $700 million are lost to corruption each and every year. You see this time and again around the world and something that developed countries have exploited in the past. Because if you find a country like Congo, Democratic Republic of Congo, it's among the top in terms of mineral resources richness. But it's also among the top in terms of poverty. And if you try to understand what's going on between the two extremes, poverty and richness in the mineral resources, you can find an answer in both Western, but also in Congo. That's an example that I was taking. In Western, why? Because 
we really know who is looking for the, for those minerals to transform them. We know what they make. We know how they are transformed. We have electrical powered vehicles. We are ruling, we are driving them now. So we have the top technology in America. We know how it is made. We know what it needs in terms of raw materials. Where do we get them? Where do we get them? We have to find them from Congo. Uh, we have to find them from Niger, the uranium and ETC resources. But also, when you go to Congo on the other side, you will find a government that is kindly present in Kinshasa, the capital. But if you go in the surrounding towns, another example that I can tell you is I was looking on a, a road in Niger that's used for transportation of uranium from where it is extracted to airport. The road is very walkable. <laughs> it's hard to walk on that street or to ride on that street. And the street is carrying every day billions of value products. And you will ask yourself, so how this is working? You have richness somewhere. You can't even get there on, on a proper med road. But everyone knows that what is extracted from there, it's a bunch of richness that is going somewhere to be transformed, to make billions. And then you feel like, how can this difference be? Either you have a weakness on the other side and you have strength on the other side. When we have both, people can sit in the room and discuss, hey, you are taking these materials. We want them to be transformed in our area. We want investment in our area. Yes, we don't have the final industry to transform this, but we have the raw materials. Let's have a partnership to develop together. So that is missing in the game. If it is found, Africa can try to do better than it is doing today. In addition, the elites of these countries need to work to make sure the benefits of the sale of these resources are shared broadly with society rather than locked away in their own personal bank accounts. It is unfortunate to see this continue to happen in countries around the world. If we want to find a way to end these undemocratic transitions, putting an end to corruption is key in that fight. Of course, as people begin to wonder how yet another coup in a country far, far away matters to them, I want to bring the conversation around to focus a little on immigration. We recently saw a surge of asylees queuing at the U.S. southern border, with activists having called it a mini United Nations, pointing to the fact that there are people from all over the world who are trying to find a way to come to America. While it may seem like the U.S. is isolated from the refugee crisis in Africa, it may shock people to hear that many Africans do make it to the southern border after a very arduous journey. How can we respond to this crisis as more people will be forced to leave their homes as coups continue to pop up? You mentioned partnership. It's very vital to make things work. You mentioned immigrants. When you see the Mediterranean road where hundreds of thousands are dying every day, youth people, strong people can contribute to the regeneration of the economies of countries. It's a shame to the entire community, if I may say. And why is it happening? People are losing hope. People are hopeless. And they don't find any other way except taking those dangerous roads in the sea with a boat, with a canoe. You can't paddle this for those many days in the sea. So they take that road knowing what happened to the previous ones and knowing the dangers they may meet, but they don't have another choice to make. Why is it happening? Because countries in Africa, in Asia, the countries in the other side of the world, the Western countries, they are getting richer. Not everyone, but we have that wealth accumulation among the wealthiest. It's getting bigger. We are celebrating being among the billionaires every day. We celebrate that. So there is that lack of partnership and accountability and responsibility, humanism. They are very paramount to tackle this challenge around the world. The movements of immigration that you are seeing, there is no question that it's propelled by the lack of resources, the climate change that is 
also a big issue nowadays. The conflicts in the areas, when you go, for example, to the countries we've been mentioning in Africa, if you count active conflicts, they are more than 10. You go in Congo, you find an active conflict. You go in uh, those Sahel countries, there is active military conflicts. You go in Nigeria, you have Boko Haram conflict in the area, which is touching many countries, not only Nigeria, Cameroon, Nigeria, we mentioned, Central Africa, there is an active conflict. So these conflicts, those wars, they are preparing the movements of immigrants. First of all, people are going to camps, internal camps, and from those camps, if they have a chance, they will be resettled in a third country, namely USA, Australia, or Europe, Belgium, or whatever. That's the trend we are seeing. And countries are corrupt. The corruption is at high level. You find among those countries we've been mentioning that the management of the national wealth is among few people. And there is no hope for the normal citizen or the normal population. So those are many reasons that are pushing people to take a way out of the country to find any hope. Where? In those developed countries. When they get there, it's another issue again. Beyond the immigration issue, the coup in Gabon further signals that military takeovers are a legitimate means to changing government, particularly in light of the weak response from international organizations. In addition, the country of Gabon is part of OPEC, the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries. And with gas prices starting to rise again, any further disruption to this global market will increase pressures on prices. They are also one of the top exporters of manganese, which is a critical component in steel production. It also continues to show the decaying nature of the international order, as might makes right becomes the thinking in countries across the world. Finally, it has shown a weakness of Western-led development and support. Despite the millions of dollars spent on aid in these countries, development was just not forthcoming. There are a multitude of reasons for this, including the previously mentioned corruption, but in the eyes of everyday citizens in these countries, the reasons don't matter, the results, or lack thereof, do. Some people may take this as a call to reduce global aid and retreat from the world. However, I see this as a rallying cry to do better and build with countries in ways that respect local traditions, cultures, and realities. This does not mean enabling strong men at the expense of democracy. It does not mean sending blank checks and saying, do with it as you will. Also does not mean ramming economic changes through that might not make sense for a given context. Western-led democracies are responsive to their own populations and bring community leaders into the policy-making process in various ways bringing together all sectors of society to devise solutions to systemic issues and put the pressure where we can exert positive change is the path forward. As is the case in all things international, there are no easy solutions to these big and complex problems. This is no reason to throw our collective hands up and give up. Bold solutions take a variety of voices to create and sustain them. Governments will not put sufficient attention into issues unless they hear from enough constituents that it matters to them. As I have said in previous episodes, the only way to make sure your voice is not heard is to never use it. This has been the Global on the Granite State podcast, a program of the World Affairs Council of New Hampshire. Thank you for taking the time to listen and to continue engaging in global conversations that broaden understanding and help make your little slice of the world better. If you have any feedback on this episode or the full series, I would love to hear it. We want to know what interests you and how we can better serve our diverse global community. You know the drill. Tim Horgan is the host, producer, director, audio technician, and yada, 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 yada. Our theme music is admin by A.A. Alto. And our interlude music is Stay Free by Bo DeLeesens. We'll be back next month with another great conversation. And we hope you will too.